welcome to the uh, IOM Fall Seminar Series. And um, before we get started on today's talk uh, that will be given by Steve Simon, we have a chance for any announcements. So does anyone have anything to, that they want to, to say? Uh, any updates? Oh, right. just one thing, one thing that's kind of fun. Um, after eight years, we're finally doing our most sophisticated organic analysis with Curiosity on okay. Mars. So stay tuned for that. The right. EMAH liquid, yeah. Uh, yeah. liquid test. So yeah. I, those always take them a long time before they tell anybody <laughs> what they found. But uh, <laughs> right. it's pretty neat after all this time. Right. And I, uh, you know, it, I, it's um, really sad to have to mention this also today, but uh, I was just reading where John Wasson passed away. So, oh. Oh. yeah, so that's, that, that's something I just, just, just saw a little bit ago. So Karen, Karen Ziegler alerted me to that. So I know Thank he was, mentioning that. he was, he the... was not in uh, good health, but um, it's always a shocker. So anyway. Many years ago, we had a uh, meteoritical society meeting in Arkansas, and one of the highlights of that was actually visiting his boyhood farm. Yeah, sure. Which he still owned. Yeah, that's that's actually highlighted in that. Uh, you know, Derek Sears did a couple of papers on um, some papers on uh, you know notable meteoriticists, and there's one on one about John Wasson, and it shows his his family home or his family farm with the stream running through it and so, so forth. So he would, he would, he, he was the farmer boy. He had to get yeah. up at <laughs> three in the morning and milk the cows every morning. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Well, anyway, with uh, uh, Steve, I'll hand it over to you. Are you going to run your PowerPoint from your computer? Uh, I was sure going to try. Yeah, that's, that's the plan. Okay. Um, are you recording it? You wanted to rec did is it, Beth recording it? Somebody it's recording. Yeah. So yeah. So them? I guess okay. Beth got that going. Okay. Very good. Well, um, I'll hand it over to you. Look forward to hearing about the the. Uh, I guess all I the okay. All the things around all the things around the fall that you guys uh, participated in a few years back. Yep. Yeah. This is two thousand three. Right. Okay. Let me know what you're seeing. Are you seeing my title slide? Yep. Okay. So uh, the, uh, that fireball that we saw about a month or so ago, uh, there was a fireball in the Albuquerque area and people were talking about where it might've fallen and it reminded me of, a, of an event that I experienced uh, when I was in the Chicago area back in 2003. Uh, a meteorite happened to fall in the village where I was living. And uh, I worked on it with uh, several people here. Uh, at the time, I was working with Larry Grossman, so he participated in the study. We got uh, Bob Clayton and Tash Maeda did oxygen isotopic analyses. Jim Schwade was a local meteorite collector. He has a very big meteorite collection, and he helped uh, help us put together the strewn field map that I'll show you. Paul, Sabir, Paul Sapira is also a meteorite scientist, and he, got, he was there uh, where the action was even before I got there. Uh, John Wacker measured cosmogenic radionuclides, and uh, Minnie Wadwa was the curator of meteorites at the time at, at the Field Museum. Oh, let me try this. So uh, just to get you oriented, uh, Chicago is in extreme northeastern Illinois on the extreme southwestern shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, the Park Forest is in the far, far south suburbs of Chicago. Here's Chicago, here's O'Hare. And uh, the Stringfield location is down here, right on the boundary, straddling the boundary of uh, southern edge of Cook County and the very northern edge of the next county below it, Will County. And uh, here, so here's a view of what it looked like. This is from a, uh, a police car uh, somewhere in southern Illinois. Um, I don't know exactly who provided this view. I'll show it to you again. So this is a v very bright flash. It was seen uh, from several states, including Indiana, Michigan, and I think even Missouri. And here's an even better view of it. 
uh, well, let me show you. So the previous view, uh, if you look at a timestamp, that's uh, eight minutes before midnight. This next view is at eight minutes before one in the morning. This is from Michigan, uh, the South Haven Police Department. So this is from the other side of Lake Michigan from Chicago in the Eastern time zone. And if you look uh, right around here, you'll see the meteorite coming, sort of coming towards you and it's falling and making these flashes. And uh, it breaks up as it comes through the atmosphere. It comes at the, hit, hits the atmosphere at a very high speed. It, uh, it gets hot on the outside and um, gets melted a little bit and gives off a lot of light. And it also tries to sort of punch a hole through the atmosphere. So uh, air builds up in front of the rock as it's coming in and there's essentially less air behind it. So very big difference in air pressure and it sort of gets pulled apart by that air pressure difference. So that's what it looked like. And that, here's what, uh, if you compile those frames, you can get a good sense of the me meteorite heading right towards uh, South Haven, Michigan. And if you look at, from this view, it looks like it fell just like right behind the, the police station. But this is actually 100 miles away. It's the other side of Lake Michigan and it's uh, north of Chicago. And where it fell was south of Chicago. <clears throat> so uh, I was home at the time and I was still awake. Uh, I'd been out that night. I went traveled into the city with my son to, to see the Bulls game. And in the course of 27 years in Chicago, that was the only Bulls game we ever attended. So I was still up and I saw the flash shine through our lined curtains of our living room. But having been out and knowing it had been rainy and cloudy, I thought it was just lightning, uh, just kind of got diffused by clouds at high altitude. And uh, even though the flash lasted longer than the split second the lightning usually does, I didn't think much of it, so I just went to bed. Now, fortunately, in those days, we were using our uh, clock radio as an alarm, and uh, it went off in the morning, and we heard the news. They announced on the news that a meteorite fell in Park Forest. And my wife says, oh, you should go down there and check it out. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I'll go down there. There'll be a police officer holding a rock. He'll be scratching his head. He'll, he'll hand it to me, and it won't be a meteorite. But... I also want to get two chips of the light, light rock and the dark rock. Here's a piece of dark rock I got, but I couldn't get a piece of the light rock that I wanted, but it was getting time uh, to leave. I had to get into the town and uh, get the sample packed up and shipped off. <clears throat> so I went to say goodbye to the police officer who was helping me. I shook my hand, shook, stuck my hand out. He stuck his out and in his hand, a little piece of the light lithology. He winked and said, in the interest of science. So I thought that was a great Chicago moment. <clears throat> so off I went, we got the samples uh, shipped off and we got the chip sent out for, uh, for thin sections for, for us to study in the microscope. And the next day I went to a, a local house where uh, my kids took piano lessons and went to pick them up from piano lessons. And there was a sign there, uh, apparently a meteorite collector had already been there and looked, checked, their, checked their yard and put up a sign and said, if you think you have a meteorite, give me a call, I might buy it. 
So I thought I could do that too. And I know where, who, who, where people are calling that have meteorites. They were still calling the police department. So I went home, made up my own sign and took this down to the police department. And they were only too glad to have people to forward calls to me. And sure enough, the phone was ringing before I even got home from there. And uh, <clears throat> my family had a field calls the next few days of people who said they had the meteorite. So it didn't take long to put together a list of people who said they had samples for me to look at. So uh, I thought, oh, this is great. Because usually when people call you up and say they don't have a, they have a meteorite, they, they don't have a meteorite. But I figured this time people have meteorites. <clears throat> so I head out and go to find the first place. I talk to the guy and he shows me a piece of the sidewalk. So he was pretty embarrassed, but uh, I, I took it in stride and went on to the next place. And, uh, and this person did have a meteorite. So here's a nice example of, uh, of an example. Uh, a few inches across, they weren't, most of them weren't all that big. You can see a piece of the fusion press here. This is what's left from the outside of the meteorite as it came through the atmosphere, the little piece that melted. <clears throat> and this is on a shelf uh, on somebody's, somebody's uh, uh, grill, gas grill. About a first uh, somebody into their room. <clears throat> it was in the news, and I managed to find a place. And uh, that was much of a piece. So that made these holes in the ceiling here. It uh, crashed down, came right down along these lines. In it. <clears throat> the rock bounced across the room, this mirror here, then bounced back across the room, again, just missing the person in that bed. This is a picture of me in that broken mirror talking to the homeowner, uh, Mr. Garza. And here's the piece safely at the, at the uh, police station. So it's a good uh, five and a half pound rock. Good. And that's one of the bigger pieces that was found. And uh, that became known as the Garza stone. And I think it sold for about 50. And he gave this talk and I went to their exhibit and I found I learned something about this. And here is a little, I had a little write up about the Garza stone. Uh, and you just saw me speaking with the Garza. It weighed almost six pounds, I think it was like five and a half. It tore a hole in the roof, split a joist in the attic, crashed through the ceiling like I showed you, dented a window sill, window sill as I showed you, broke a mirror across the room like you, and came to rest next to the kid who bed. <clears throat> What I didn't know is that there were termites in the attic and uh, there were, the victims were killed when the meteorite broke through the roof becoming the only fatalities of Park Forest Fall. <clears throat> and if you uh, have any doubt about what fanatics meteorite collectors are and meteorite artifact collectors are, they actually had one of the, dead, one of the deceased termites uh, on exhibit preserved. So I got to see a termite from Park Forest meteorite. So meteorites, collectors not only collect meteorites, collect things damaged by meteorites and, uh, and, and meteorites themselves, and I apparently did termites. On to my uh, tour of Park Forest, here's a finder who called in and uh, here he's demonstrating uh, how magnetic the rock is, that a magnetic uh, a screwdriver is, will stick to the rock. <clears throat> Here's a, this one looks so black because it's com almost completely uh, covered in fusion crust. So that's a very nice piece. And here is the, the hole in the ground where it's found. One day a woman came to my office with a specimen that had a lot of yellow stuff on it. And there's a better view of it. And at first I thought it was some kind of sulfur deposit or something like that. But then she mentioned that she found a rock in the street by running over it with her car. And I found my way back to the, uh, to the intersection where that happened. And I found this hole in the ground. So I, I think the rock might have hit there, but, or, but even if it didn't, that, that yellow stuff is most likely uh, paint, uh, like they use uh, on curbs. And I think, and uh, meteorite collectors like to buy up damaged curbs even to mailboxes, anything meteorites hit. So that's an interesting story. And it has some fusion crust, some scuff marks from where she ran over it. This is another clearly hand sample, also from Park Forest itself. Uh, this one got lodged in a, a roof of a, of the, of a um, car wash. It broke up into pieces, but the pieces fit together nicely. <clears throat> South of Park Forest in the towns of Steger and Crete, 
much smaller pieces were found. These pieces are very small, <clears throat> small, but people found them anyway. This little dimple here is actually a mini, mini crater in the roof of a minivan. Maybe something like this, maybe this piece. This is my favorite little photos of a little on your right, a penny for scale. Nice little individual piece, was completely covered in fusion crust. You can see the fresh material. And this is just a photograph on a paper towel. And at the other end of the scale, here's <clears throat> one of the biggest pieces that I know of. This was uh, actually embedded in a, in a lawn. I guess the ground was pretty soft from the rain that night. And this is embedded in somebody's lawn just north of Park Forest. And uh, the person didn't find it until uh, so, uh, about a month later when he noticed grass growing in a spot in his lawn. So that's why it's kind of brownish because it, it was dug out of the ground. One piece that I didn't have to go running after was a piece that uh, got lodged in the roof of the firehouse in Park Forest. It's the, fi it's the fire station. So they had the, again, necessary equipment to go get it. They put up that ladder, <clears throat> found the hole in the roof. Guy reached in and pulled out a nice meteorite. And uh, this is the, uh, so this is them on the roof and this is the uh, chief of police uh, providing some security. This, did, this uh, has an, well, caused a little stress too because uh, this is one piece that the Field Museum uh, was able to buy. Uh, most of the private individuals sold to collectors. But uh, it was a little stressful because as the Field Museum and its lawyers are putting together the proposal, the, the get going price for the sample is going up almost on a daily basis. But then the lawyers are reviewing the documents that are submitted to the Park Forest Board of Trustees. The Village Board had a vote on it. <clears throat> I think they managed to get the price uh, raised a little bit, but uh, fortunately the Park Forest Board did agree to sell it at a slightly less than the going price. And this piece did become the uh, this type, the reference specimen and in the possession of the Field Museum. The field got a few other pieces and, and put together a temporary exhibit up in their hallway, one of their hallways, and this is what it looked like with <clears throat> some information and a few other pieces. And I think this is the, uh, the uh, type specimen. So, and so I was able, I put together uh, the nomination of the Park Forest name, the documentation uh, <clears throat> to the Meteoritical Society's uh, nomenclature committee and got it officially named uh, the, the Park Forest Meteorite. <clears throat> so here's the map of the strewn field that we put together with all the documented finds that we could assemble uh, over the first uh, few, several months. Color-coded uh, for size. So the bluer pieces, <clears throat> the bluer spots rep represent small pieces. The reddish ones, the larger pieces, uh, you can see clear uh, southeastern northwest trend getting bigger and bigger. The Garza piece and that street piece are found up here. <clears throat> uh, my house was located at the star here in this gap in the strewn field where no pieces were found, even though it's on trend. Uh, this is a big forest preserve here, this gap. So this is a heavily wooded area. And you can see a lot of pieces are found along roads and, and where people live. So uh, we have a clear trend again from smaller pieces down here and much larger pieces up here. And uh, there's a good explanation for that. Uh, Peter Brown, I believe, put together this information. <clears throat> they found the documented the trajectory, the fireball trajectory actually is from the Southwest to the Northeast, perhaps headed right for South Haven, Michigan, as we thought, but the pieces are displaced to the East of that. And they were able to model, uh, they took mo our strewn field map and then modeled uh, the pieces based on various ejection heights, and you can see how high up this is. Uh, this is uh, about 30 kilometers. That's close to 20 miles in elevation. It was very bright. That's why it was seen from so many states, so from so far away. And uh, the, the, uh, the samples are displaced to the east of that because of a strong, strong wind. Uh, at that elevation, the wind was uh, probably on the order of maybe 30 meters a second, that's about 70 miles an hour, coming straight out of the west. <clears throat> so you have this meteorite falling, pieces breaking up, and a strong westerly wind. The smallest pieces are most strongly displaced from that trend, the largest pieces the least displaced from, from that trajectory. 
And does uh, someone, uh, maybe again, Peter Brown uh, worked out the, uh, the pre-atmospheric orbit. Uh, we got, they have a pretty good idea of it. And it's, uh, may, I guess, maybe went all, went all the way out from to as far, nearly almost all the way to Jupiter before becoming Earth crossing. And I guess eventually getting knocked onto a, a path that led it to that street in Bark Forest. Now let's have, let's, uh, have a look at the sample itself and work on uh, talk about its classification. What actually uh, does it look like? What type of meteorite is it? Well, it's a stony meteorite and uh, it's most likely a chondrite. There's a variety of chondrites. Some uh, start out nice and fresh looking like this with a lot of round things in it. These are called chondrules. These were, these were individual objects that uh, were in space. These were molten droplets that solidified, got made into a rock. And in this sample, it's got, it never essentially got metamorphosed and it's nice and fresh. Uh, it's a type three. Uh, and not all uh, meteorites are so lucky. Some got heated up and recrystallized and remelted and equilibrated, uh, lost a lot of their information. This is a type six. We have a range, uh, uh, the scale from type three being the least metamorphosed all the way up to a seven. So we wanted to see where Park Forest falls on that and into what chemical group it falls. So we looked at it with the scanning electron microscope to identify the minerals in it and to look at, uh, see what they look like, what the, what the texture of the minerals look like in it. So here's what we saw. Uh, in most cases, you, we did not see any chondrules. We saw some typical minerals, um, olivine, high calcium pyroxene, low calcium pyroxene, these are silicate minerals. There was some maskelonite. Uh, this is started as plagioclase. Maskelonite means indicates a high degree of shock got shock impacted uh, and got recrystallized. Also iron sulfide <clears throat> and iron nickel metal. Uh, so that's what makes, that makes it kind of dense and makes it, uh, helps it respond to meteorites. So this is uh, an example of the light lithology in the, in the rock. And here's an example of the dark lithology. Same minerals, here's a bit of phosphate. But to here we can see, um, even though it's the same mineralogy, this is the dark rock. And you can see quickly a deep, uh, difference. You see all these light colored veins. <clears throat> these are little veins of iron sulfide. Iron sulfide is opaque to light. So this, the dark lithology had very short light paths between these veins. They don't let light in or out. So that's why it looks so dark. This, uh, this type of image the, uh, is, is essentially the average uh, how heavy that target is, what you're hitting. So the iron sulfide that's very white is very efficient at backscattering your electrons, giving you a very bright signal. The mescalinite doesn't have iron in it, so it looks very dark. So all this iron sulfide is heavy, <clears throat> shows up very nicely, filling every little crack. So this, uh, to an, an optical light, this looks very, this looks black. We did find, uh, again, here's a picture of light lithology. This is what a a conjure looks like after it's been reheated. So there's a, this is a remnant of a conjure, not a fresh looking one like the one I just showed you. <clears throat> but here you can see these, like, it still has lots of cracks, but there's no sulfide in it. These cracks are black, it means they're empty. So light can pass through them. So this is a conjure in the light lithology. But we can find some of the things in the dark lithology. And again, every little crack is filled with that opaque iron sulfide, not letting light pass. So the lithologies are very similar to each other, except for these veins of iron sulfide. <clears throat> the rock has rock fragments in it, fragments of rock within the other rock, and some, some of these black veins in it too. Some, sometimes when rocks get impacted and shocked, they also have some melting, so you get a veins of liquid can flow in there. And this, would, this is what that looks like in, uh, in the electron microscope. Uh, you have, it also, it also looks dark, very sulfide rich. Now onto the mineral compositions. You can see uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, the mineral compositions are very uniform. You can see the, for example, the pyroxene, this iron silicate and the olivine, another iron silicate, very uniform uh, color. I mean, and in this case, um, the, that reflects a very uniform iron content, a very uniform iron magnesium ratio because the iron is a heavy element, so it's very, very sensitive to, uh, to the electron beam. 
So we measured the, the compositions, the iron magnesium ratios and the olivine. <clears throat> Here are two samples of the light lithology and they have a very uniform ratio of about 24.7 in this case. Very, very, this is a very narrow range. Both samples are very dominant single composition. The dark lithology has also that very similar composition for that same ratio. Pyroxene, again, very, very narrow range of iron magnesium ratios, a very narrow range of the iron bit rich com component, about 20%. So that can help us, this can help us classify the meteorite uh, chemically. And the dark lithology, again, has that same composition. <clears throat> So there are several different uh, chemical types of uh, ordinary chondrites, ordinary stony chondrites. <clears throat> and they generally have uh, vary in terms of how oxidized their iron is. Uh, if, they have, if they have a lot of metal, they have high iron, they're the H, less iron, they're L chondrites, and low, low iron, or more oxidized iron is the LL chondrites. And this shows that both uh, the light and the dark lithologies fall well within the alchondrite range in this, in this uh, graph from Brearley and Jones. <clears throat> We've got the iso oxygen isotopic compositions measured by uh, Bob Clayton and Tash Maeda. Uh, this is uh, the isotopic composition of oxygen and minerals is in, indicates, is often indicates uh, the parent body. And uh, there are many different parent bodies of meteorites and many different representative isotopic compositions. So those uh, chondrite groups that I just showed you also vary in terms of their isotopic compositions. <clears throat> the H's tend to plot down here. Uh, the L's are in the middle and the L's are up here. So in terms of isotopic compositions, uh, the isotopic compositions agree with the mineral compositions that it's an L chondrite. Here are the results from our cosmogenic radionuclides. Uh, here are the half-lives, so this cobalt-56, it, it half of it decays within 77 days. <clears throat> this one is 5.3 years, and these range up to 700,000 years. And their measurement, their activity is measured in decays per minute per kilogram. So they were able, able to get these measurements. And some of them increase with depth, uh, like a sort of a chain reaction but some are only a form at the surface of a, of a, of a rock, of a meteorite up, out in space. So, and so if you look at these, these values can give you an idea of the pre-atmospheric size. <clears throat> so we got an estimate of uh, about at least 900 kilograms of its size, and, uh, but only, we could only count for 40 kilograms of it. Uh, I think a lot of it fell in that forest preserve. A lot of it may have fallen in the lake in the forest preserve. And uh, a lot of it's sort of just blended in or maybe broke up and were into very small pieces. Other ways of estimating the size come from the amount of energy released when it hit the atmosphere, both in, times, in terms of light, uh, infrasound, there are, there are atmospheric seismic waves. I think they're picked up as far away as Canada. So these are estimates of the energy in terms of kilotons of TNT. So the estimates of the mass are more like uh, 10,000 kilograms on the order of 10,000 kilograms. And these uh, size estimates are pretty uh, uniform at about a, a radius of one meter. Or in other words, uh, it was about six, the rock was about six feet across before it uh, started breaking up. So I think it's pretty good that it broke up into largely uh, harmless pieces. You wouldn't want a, a chunk of rock that size uh, weighing hundreds of pounds uh, hitting your house. I guess only one person would have gotten hit. So some people, some people made some money. Uh, some people had a good time. And uh, well, I didn't get rich off of it. I didn't get a sample, but <laughs> let's, it was very interesting. And so our conclusions of our study, uh, uh, we could classify it as an L chondrite. Uh, there's a, 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 a on the degree of alteration or, or how metamorphosed it is, we classified it as a type five on a scale of three being unmetamorphosed and seven being, I think, completely remelted and reformed. Uh, we did see some 
you could find a few chondrules in it, so you call that top five. Type five wasn't completely obliterated. And the shock scale, it's a six uh, because it was fairly shocked with mescalinite and uh, shock veins. And as we saw from the pictures, it's a breccia with light class in a dark matrix. <clears throat> that matrix is black due to its fine network of veins of iron sulfide. And this has been seen in other uh, shock chondrites. And we concluded that the uh, pre-atmospheric size was at least 900 kilograms. I guess based on those energy, energy estimates, that's, um, that's a, certainly a lower limit. And uh, only about 90 pounds have been recovered so far. Maybe a little more since uh, the writing of this, but not much more that I, than, that I know of. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, oh, no. oh, yeah, we did uh, publish a paper on it. Uh, the, the timing of this was interesting. Uh, the meteorite fell in the last week of uh, March, well, March 23rd. And if it had fallen a couple of weeks earlier, I would have been, I would have missed it. I would have been in Houston at the conference. And if it fell a few weeks later, it would have been too late to get an abstract in from Meteorical Society. But we did get a meteor, an abstract in, and uh, we did write up a paper of those people uh, that I mentioned here. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hey, Steve. Yes. Anthony Love from North Carolina. Uh -huh. Talk. Um, I, I heard there were a whole bunch of collectors in the area when, when it was announced that it fell. Were they good about reporting weights that they collected? Is, is there some discrepancy of the weight based on how much was collected or? Uh, I don't think so. I think Paul Sapira and Jim Schwade were most helpful in, in that area. Uh, but yeah, they got in there right away. In fact, Paul Sapira was in his car, uh, I guess, that morning. And he got to the police station before I did. And uh, Jim Schwade got, was very active, too. Um, uh, he tracked down a lot of pieces and helped uh, compile that strewn field map. But uh, yeah, I guess I, I don't know what I don't know. Um, there are, I guess there are lots of pieces on the market and uh, they're in quite a few in collections though, but I didn't have to, I was, I was on the ground trying to acquire pieces for academic collectors <clears throat> rather than people just buying them up. So we did have competition. Okay. And uh, I think uh, Arizona State and the Few Museum and the American Museum of Natural History pulled their resources to buy a few pieces. Or I think they got a, a big piece or two and, and cut them up a bit. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So what what was the going price again? Did you mention that? I I think I missed it. No, well, I, well, I kept going up almost on a daily basis. Uh, so what your idea of what a good price was kept changing, kind of like your idea of what the good price for gas is. That can change in, a, in over a few days too. It it got up into the high teens, I believe. Per gram. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, uh, hey, Carl, hey, hey, Carl, this is Matt. Yeah, I, I paid like 10, 15. I paid 40 for one that hit a fire plug. That's wow. absolutely stunning. Yeah. Do you still have it or did you? I do. Uh, it, has, it has yellow paint on it and it's oriented on one side. And I've so, got a picture of the, picture of the fire plug too. <laughs> it's, so, it's such an amazing fall, you know. Uh, it's, it, it is uh, there. In near, near an urban area, and then all these, you know, holes and roofs. It's, uh, it's yes. a fabulous story, really. And the Field Museum has purchased some some of the debris from somebody's house. They they got a dented rain gutter, I think, or something. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, a lot of the artifacts. Hey, Steve, yeah, Steve. Steve, did anybody do any uh, studies on the fusion crust? I know it, it seems like it's very thin and flaky, especially over some of those dark areas versus the light areas, and I, I just wondered if any uh, studies have been done. No, not that I know of. Uh, you know, the rocks melt as they come through the atmosphere and a little bit of milk solidifies, so it is, it's temp generally uh, glassy and, and fragile. There are some, some pieces with good uh, fusion on them, uh, but it's, it's not a special meteorite, so I don't know, I'm not too interested in fusion crust, so. Uh, I try to get to the fresh stuff on the inside and stay away from it. But it would be a good sample study for a fusion crust, especially since more pieces were collected pretty quickly, so much weathering. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I think fusion crust, though, at the same time is um, underappreciated. <laughs> I mean, they say, don't give me any fusion crust, you know. And, um, but, but you know, it's kind of interesting because uh, fusion crust sometimes, I mean, I'm not saying that you should use it as a determinative um, uh, factor in your, in, in, research about the makeup of the um, actual meteor meteorite, but you do see widely varying types of fusion crust. You know, you see some fusion crusts that are highly vesicular, some that aren't, um, some that are thin, some that aren't thin, and so on. And it's um, it's pretty interesting. Um, it, uh, yeah, but, fusion yeah. crust, uh, you've done this, Carl, actually, I think, and that is um, the, the fusion crust can... can and we do have to that confirm that it's a meteorite. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I always, that's the first thing I ask when I get something from Northwest Africa. They'll be saying like, oh, I'm sure this is a Martian or I'm sure, that, you know, and usually it's, you know, a hunk of uh, terrestrial basalt or if, at, at best. And, uh, you know, my first question is, well, is it fusion crusted, you know? But surprisingly, uh, you know, I've had the occasion where I'll be analyzing something and I'll be scratching my head and I'm thinking like, is this, what is this thing? You know, <laughs> it looks, it might be a meteorite. And then, and then, uh, and then the, the, the collector or dealer goes like, oh, and by the way, it has fusion crust. And I think, gee, thanks. Thanks for telling, you know, you can say that up front. That saves me a lot of agonizing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. Fusion crust uh, on a weathered meteorite can be really hard to identify. Our, um, our, our little uh, chondrite show and tell piece that we've used for decades, uh, uh, for the longest time, for literally 10 years, I would, I would say, no, there's no, you know, look, there's no fusion crust on this. And then one day, I think uh, maybe it was Rianne pointed out to me that if you looked really closely in, the, in that little depression, <laughs> you could actually see that there was some black uh, that there was a little bit of black fusion crust still preserved within right. uh, uh, within the regmaglyphs on the outside of that uh, that sample. So I was like, oh my gosh, um, uh, it's but it was subtle. This is not something you know. It, it was really uh, hard to see, but it's worth looking for um, uh, in a weathered rock. Whether uh, in the depression, you mm -hmm. see see uh, you you can preserve yeah. some. Some some examples. You know, Steve, you mentioned that um, that fireball that from the a few weeks ago here. Yeah. And um, sadly, I guess that ended up uh, going out towards Texas or something out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I said in, it could be in Texas. Yeah, you guys thought it was in, just uh, like in rattlesnake country. <laughs> you know, uh, probably eastern New Mexico or west Texas or something. Yeah. The Panhandle. Uh, that, that that too bad, huh? Because yeah. you know. But but that's the thing, you know. If it falls in a place that's remote, it's hard it's hard to track it down unless it's you know a gigantic strewn field or something. But yeah, so that was not the case in Park Forest. Uh, yeah. It was a well documented area, and so people flew in. It was in the news. So yeah, these meteors flew in right away. Right. <clears throat> I'm still wondering what's sitting out there right now, <laughs> I, weathering away. <laughs> yeah. I was curious, Carl, what what you think of uh, the strategy. Um, and what you would do nowadays if an opportunity like this occurred. I mean, it's conceivable that, that uh, you know, the Institute will be called up on something. We had, I had something like this, and of course it was just like gravel on the road. But uh, Well, you have to get where, <laughs> you know, Mike Farmer and, and, uh, and, and Bob, Robert Ward get there, because otherwise it'll all be bought up. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I'm hoping the next fall in New Mexico will be in my backyard. <laughs> and then we'll have a, a meteorite from Placitas. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's really unlikely, but you know, should we have a, a, a fund that, that we can actually use for this purpose or? Um, uh, I, think I, mean, you, I, think you, I think you should start it, Horton. Well, we, we, know? Could, we could do that, you know, uh, right. I mean, the foundation, right. but um, yeah. perhaps. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting thought that, um, yeah. and I know. I guess I guess I was pointing more towards your 
terrific relationship with many of the dealers. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, obviously, if we have something in New Mexico or nearby, we're all going to be uh, active in that, I can imagine. So, but um, again, New Mexico, the challenges, of course, you know, the uh, low population density and the falls out in the middle of nowhere, it's going to be hard to find, you know. Yeah. I mean, that was the trouble with this last one. I talked to a couple of people who are meteorite hunters and they were like, well, you know, it's probably out there. It's probably, you know, maybe at best a couple of small stones could just basically trying to look for a needle in a haystack, you know, but. Well, the other, the other tool that people are using is weather radar. Yeah. Yeah. Just actually sure. recorded. Um, but I don't know if, you know, I mean, you know, we obviously have no, no funding or anything for your recovery operations, but are there people who are really jumping all that kind of data right away? Yeah, they did with this last one. Sure. Yeah. It's all been tracked. It was all, it was all tracked. Sure. There's a, there's a website that has all that information. Um, I don't have it at my fingertips right now, but yeah. Anyway. Wait, the other, the other issue is, uh, you know, that's not where you're going to get a rare meteorite type. <laughs> well, you don't know. I mean, that's, for example, uh, there have been a couple of uh, CMs recently that have fallen, right? There, there was the one in Panama, or no, not in Panama, Costa Rica. And then, re and right now, there is actually a, a carbonaceous chondrite that, that we're analyzing that fell in... Uh, <clears throat> fell in Morocco. And so, um, so they don't, they're not all uh, ordinary chondrites, you know, I mean, obviously it'd be great to have a lunar fall or something, right? You know, we've never had a lunar <laughs> fall, but um, hmm. I'm hoping for a Venusian <laughs> fall in my, in my backyard, you know. Amen. I can get a Nobel. I can get a Nobel Prize and also secure my retirement fund. <laughs> we need a team of of, of, of people who are not uh, uh, so screaming busy. So I see your Bowley's on. He's one of our enthusiasts um, at UNM, who's helped out before uh, with stuff. So um, uh, our, uh, you know, we, we did have people in the past who are interested in trying to go out and sure. look at things. Sure. Sure. Uh, what I'd really like to have, though, is a uh, portable XRF to take out <laughs> to be able to identify these things. Sure. I tried getting funding from NASA. Well, they have, you know, you'll find now that a lot of the 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 meteorite hunters have those. So, I know they do. They, a lot of them have those in Morocco for sure. Mm. They, they think that it can replace an electron microprobe, unfortunately, <laughs> which, obvi which obviously it can't. <laughs> well, always especially to me. Martian. I always, I'm getting these uh, eukrites that, you know, some, I get a, from a Moroccan dealer, they'll send me, Anthony, Anthony may have this happen occasionally as well, but they send me a, uh, something that ends up being a eukrite and they go, oh no, it's lunar. I know it's for sure that it's a lunar and not a eukrite because we did an XRF, you know, we, we zapped it with our XRF and it has the right iron manganese ratio, you know, and I'm like, yeah. well, you know, you don't believe me, I'm, I can't help it, you know, but we prefer the electron microprobe analyses, so anyway. Well, Steve, thanks again so much.